वेलकम बैक टू द इमरजेंसी मेडिसिन लेक्चर सीरीज इन द प्रीवियस वीडियो वी हैव डिस्कस्ड अबाउट द इंपॉर्टेंस ऑफ ऑप्टिमल मैनेजमेंट ऑफ फ्लूइड इन अ पेशेंट हु इज एडमिटेड टू द हॉस्पिटल फ्लूइड्स फॉर रेसिस्टेशन फ्लूइड्स फॉर रिप्लेसमेंट फ्लूइड्स फॉर रूटीन मेंटेनेंस बट बिफोर गोइंग टू गिव फ्लूइड्स टू एनी पेशेंट यू नीड टू assess their volume status and how they are going to respond to your fluids that is fluid responsiveness assessing volume status and fluid responsiveness is a very very important topic that we are going to discuss in the current video i am dr s prakash babu associate professor of emergency medicine kims and rc changalpattu evaluation and management of intravascular volume and a central challenge in caring for critically ill patients especially so in the emergency departments the therapeutic goal of fluid administration is to increase the preload or the stress venous volume leading to an increased stroke volume and cardiac output failure rate of any volume resuscitation is almost 50% so we need to be very very careful when we are drafting a fluid management protocol for any patient before going into fluid management assessment we need to learn about the cardiac output cardiac output is the amount of blood that is pumped out of the heart per minute so what are the factors that affect cardiac output cardiac output is affected by the venous tone that is the peripheral vascular resistance and the arterial tone both combined are called the peripheral or systemic vascular resistance the venous return that is reaching the heart the filling pressure in the right ventricle when you are looking at the systemic circulation the filling pressure of the left ventricle when you are looking at the pulmonary circulation and the resistance to outflow of the left ventricle determines the cardiac output heart rate and contractility can be influenced by autonomic nervous system by way of catecholaminergic stimulation or the vagus by way of depressing the heart rate and the depressing the contractility so let's have a look at the venous return and cardiac output and their relationship cardiac output is a function of heart rate multiplied with the stroke volume you all know that in terms the stroke volume is influenced by the filling pressures that is preload at the end diastolic pressure of the right ventricle cardiac muscle contractility and the force against which it has to pump the blood that is the afterload of the systemic vascular resistance the right ventricular end diastolic pressure is in turn dependent on the central venous pressure whereas the left ventricular end diastolic pressure is dependent on the pulmonary venous pressure the relationship between the end diastolic pressure and the cardiac output is explained by frank starling's law in this picture you can see frank starling's curves and their relationship with cardiac output venous return in relation to the end diastolic volume of the right atrial pressure so if you look at the curve it's a sigmoid curve initially when there is increase in the venous return the right atrial pressure increases and there is increased cardiac output and at a certain point where the venous return curve and the right atrial pressure curve meet that is the operating point of the heart cardiac output and venous output are equal and the heart is functioning optimally at this stage as you go on increasing the venous return it reaches a peak and then the cardiac output flattens out even if you increase the venous return or the total blood volume your cardiac output is not going to raise above that point that is the point where you start getting complications this dashed line here shows the influence of inotropic agents if the inotropy increases 
total peripheral resistance is decreased for example in exercise the cardiac output increases in total peripheral resistance for example there is vasoconstriction cardiac output falls extensive venous return mean the systemic pressure mean systemic pressure the blood volume decreases the curve is going to come down and the cardiac output decreases the blood volume increases and the cardiac output increases one major important point you need to remember here is the relationship is not linear rather it is a sigma shaped or a parabolic curve wherein if you go on increasing the venous return it reaches a specific point until which the cardiac output output also increases linearly and then the cardiac output flattens out after that whatever you do the cardiac output is not going to increase that is a point where the complications of fluid therapy start occurring so you need to be detecting that point there are certain static parameters and certain dynamic hemodynamic parameters that tell you about the fluid status of the patient your main aim in assessing fluid status is whether the patient is going to respond to additional fluids or the patient is not going to respond or the patient is going to develop complications the static measures include the central venous pressure pulmonary arterial occlusion pressure inferior vena cava diameter ivc collapsibility and distensibility index and diastolic volume corrected flow time dynamic parameters which are very very important include pulse pressure variation stroke volume variation plethysmographic variability index and modified fluid challenge in the form of passive leg raising test or mini fluid boluses the static measures of free load reflect an individual's cardiac output at a given point of time but they cannot inform the clinician whether the patient has a preload reserve or not the test of fluid responsiveness should challenge an individual's frank starling relationship and assess assess the potential to advance in your fluid therapy either by way of increasing the blood volume or by way of increasing the other parameters like systemic vascularization cardiac contractility and things so let us have a brief look at the normal hemodynamic parameters that we assess day in and day out in the emergency department first and foremost is the arterial blood pressure the normal values include 140 to 190 to 140 mm of mercury diastolic blood pressure is somewhere between 60 to 90 mm of mercury mean arterial pressure is the most important in measuring blood pressure because this mean arterial pressure in turn indicates the tissue perfusion either systolic blood pressure or diastolic pressure doesn't increase mean arterial pressure is the one which is staying throughout the cardiac cycle and this this is an indicator of tissue perfusion specifically it's calculated by sbp plus 2 into dbp divided by 3 the normally is 70 to 105 millimeters of mercury and then the systolic pressure variation systolic pressure maximum and a systolic pressure minimum less than 5 millimeters of mercury unlikely to be preload responsive if it is greater than 5 millimeters of mercury the patient is likely to be preload responsive pulse pressure variation is calculated as pulse pressure maximum minus pulse pressure minimum divided by pulse pressure maximum plus pulse pressure minimum divided by 2 into 100 if it is less than 10 percent patient doesn't respond to fluids with more than 10 to 15 percent likely to be fluid response stroke volume vari variation stroke volume maximum is measured and stroke volume minimum is measured divided by stroke volume max minus stroke volume minimum by 2 into 100 similar to pulse pressure variation less than 10 percent unlikely to be fluid responsive more than 13 to 15 percent likely to be preload responsive right atrial pressure normal is 2 to 6 millimeters of mercury right ventricular pressure systolic is 15 to 25 millimeters of mercury diastolic is 0 to 8 millimeters of mercury 
pulmonary artery pressure systolic psp is 15 to 25 mm of mercury diastolic is 8 to 15 mm of mercury main pulmonary artery pressure is calculated as psp plus 2 into padp into one third 10 to 20 mm of mercury pulmonary artery wedge pressure measured by swan gans catheter is 6 to 12 millimeters of mercury left atrial pressure is also 6 to 12 millimeters of mercury cardiac output is 4 to 8 liters per minute cardiac index is calculated as cardiac output per minute divided by body surface area is 2.5 to 4 liters per minute per meter square stroke volume measured as cardiac output by heart rate into 1000 60 to 100 ml per beat stroke volume index is cardiac index divided by heart rate into 1000 33 to 47 ml per meter square per beat systemic vascular resistance measured as 80 into mean arterial pressure minus right atrial pressure divided by cardiac output the 800 to 1200 dynes second per centimeter square systemic vascular resistance index 80 into map minus wrap divided by cardiac index which is 1972 2390 dynes second per centimeter square per meter square pulmonary vascular resistance 80 into MPAP minus PAWP divided by cardiac output. This less than 250 dynes per second meter centimeter square. Pulmonary vascular resistance index 80 into mean pulmonary arterial pressure by mean arterial pulmonary arterial wedge pressure divided by cardiac output, which is 255 to 285 dynes per sec dynes second per centimeter square per meter square. So what do you mean by fluid responsiveness or volume responsiveness? This means an increase in stroke volume by about 10 to 15 percent after you give a fluid bolus of 500 ml rapidly over 10 to 15 minutes. If there is an increase of stroke volume or blood pressure by 10 to 15 percent, that means the patient is fluid responsive and he can take additional fluids. It also means that fluid responsive patient has a preload reserve. That means increasing the preload will increase the hemodynamics, increase the tissue perfusion. They will have an increase in stroke volume or cardiac output. Definitive test for checking fluid responsiveness is a fluid bolus test, but other parameters are often used as surrogates. Most important test is a volume challenge test it can be done in two ways by a passive leg raising test or by a mini fluid bolus test in passive leg raising test use of a simulated or small volume challenge has emerged an approach to predicting fluid responsiveness the passive leg raising test mobilizes approximately 300 ml from the lower extremities and transiently increases venous return as an auto bolus you know that the lower limb veins are called capacitance vessels what do you mean by capacitance vessels it is nothing but they can store a huge amount of blood this approximately 300 to 500 of ml of blood is stored normally either by pooling due to gravity or because of their distensibility the blood is stored you know you keep the patient in supine and then passively tilt the table to 45 degrees whatever blood that is pulled up in the lower limbs will be sent into the central circulation by way of gravity that increases the venous return and thus increases the cardiac output in patients who are fluid responsive passive leg -like test is well validated and importantly can be used in patients with spontaneously breathing and dysrhythmia patients one most important advantage of passive leg raising test is it can be fluid responsiveness can be assessed 
without having to give any fluids externally thus minimizing the chances of patient going into pulmonary edema or fluid overload status mini bolus test the same principle underlies use of mini bolus a 100 ml to 200 ml of blood fluid is given from externally a clinician assess cardiac output pre and post infusion to help predict whether a larger volume of crystalloid is likely to be beneficial or not the surrogates markers the first and foremost is the central venous pressure which has been used extensively in the past but gradually weaning off as a surrogate of fluid responsiveness because it is an invasive test and there are better non invasive methods available to our, to assess the fluid responsiveness and volume status of a patient central venous pressure is nothing but the intravascular pressure in the great thoracic veins as i told it's an invasive procedure and requires placement of a central venous catheter cvp is recommended in care of patients with septic shock even in septic shock not all the case of septic shock in a specific number of cases the cvp can be used cvp measurements fail to predict the cardiac output response to fluid bolus as i told earlier it's not a dynamic measurement it's a static measurement so it doesn't predict response of cardiac output to the fluid bolus hypovolemia and shock decrease cvp whereas fluid overload vasoconstriction and cardiac tamponade increase the central venous pressure the next is pulmonary arterial occlusion pressure paop pulmonary artery catheters can measure paop as well as cardiac output by thermodilution technique thermodilution technique a specific fluid is given through a catheter at a specified temperature and the dilution is assessed to calculate the flow paop has not proven predictive of volume responsiveness and carries risk of complications just like cvp it is also an invasive procedure and placing a pulmonary artery catheter is a complicated process absence of diffuse sonographic b line suggests an occlusion pressure of less than 80 mm of mercury so instead of actually measuring the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure you can use the ultrasound to look for sonographic b lines in the lungs by using the blue protocol and if sonographic b lines are absent it indicates an occlusion pressure of less than 80 mm of mercury and this the patient might be fluid responsive again this is a static measurement not much of useful in the emergency department so inferior vena cava measurements is the most useful technique in the emergency department initially to assess the volume responsiveness of a patient ultrasound is used to measure the inferior vena cava diameter ivc ultrasound is a non invasive and relatively easy to perform by providing an estimate of cvp the caval index the percentage collapsibility of the ivc collapsibility index has been proposed as a predictor of pre roll level the collapsibility of the ivc diameter is measured by obtaining long axis view of the ivc distal to the entry of the hepatic veins for mechanically ventilated patients instead of collapsibility index you can use the distensibility index which can be measured so the mechanics are altered inspiration is a actual process in mechanically ventilated patients changes in size or the respiratory cycle are identified with machine in m mode and distensibility ivc of 12% as strongly suggest of predictive of fluid responsiveness so this is a picture to show how you get the ivc diameter you use a curvilinear probe and obtain a subzified view of the heart once you obtain the subzified view of the heart locate the point of entry of inferior vena cava into the right atrium this is the point of entry of inferior vena cava into the right atrium and then you chase down the inferior vena cava to locate the point of entry of hepatic vein 
you have to take the measurements about 2 to 3 centimeters distal to the point of entry of the hepatic vein <coughs> where the IVC has its original diameter. So, this is the IVC diameter. Once you measure the IVC diameter, go into M mode to assess either distensibility or collapsibility. This is the maximum diameter and this is the minimum diameter. Maximum diameter divided by minimum diameter into 100 gives you the collapsibility index. If the collapsibility index is more than 50 percent, that means the patient is fluid responsive. As the actual diameter of IVC is less than 2 centimeters, the patient is said to be fluid responsive. There is a preload reserve. Flow time. Flow time is the time required for systole in the cardiac cycle. The time is corrected for heart rate and is calculated as flow time corrected is equal to systole time by square root of the total cardiac cycle time. Iotic flow time measurements typically obtained with an esophageal Doppler monitor. Pulse pressure variation, new year techniques, these are the dynamic indices which are very very useful and they predict fluid responsiveness not just the volume status at a given point. Pulse pressure variation is the difference between maximum and minimum pressure over a respiratory cycle divided by their mean. Pulse pressure variation is typically determined by a commercial hemodynamic monitor. It requires placement of an arterial catheter. Pulse pressure variation of 13 percent discriminated fluid responders accurately. Using pulse pressure variation for the prediction of volume responsiveness requires patients to be mechanically ventilated with no spontaneous respiration and there should not be any dysrhythmias. So, these are pictures to, to show how the pulse pressure variation is measured. So, this is the pulse prismographic curve, the maximum pulse pressure and here you can see the minimum pulse pressure. PPV in percentage is calculated as PP maximum minus PP minimum divided by PP maximum plus PP minimum divided by 2 into 100. Next is the stroke volume variation. Changes in stroke volume during the respiratory cycle usually measured by thermodilution techniques. An arterial catheter and a commercial monitoring system analyze the shape of the pulse pressure contour to calculate the stroke volume. SSV thresholds of 12 percent sized fluid responsiveness, SSV thresholds 12 percent sized fluid responsiveness. Next is the plethysmographic variability index is measured by a commercial device. A threshold of plethysmographic variability index of 19 percent or the 94 percent sensitive and 86 percent specific. Here it just like in pulse pressure variation, in plethysmographic variation there is a plethysmographic graph this is the mission used to measure the plethysmographic index maximum by minimum less 19 percent is 94 percent sense to and 86 percent specific. Next is the echocardiography accurate non-invasive estimation of CVP by IVC size and PAOP by Doppler mitral flow. E by A ratio or tissue Doppler E by E A ratio. And diastolic ventricular area has been studied as a marker of volume responsiveness. Dynamic echocardiographic parameters like changes in stroke volume are measured by velocity time integral. Now, this is a pulse Doppler. You can measure the mitral volume area with a pulse Doppler. E wave velocity during the rapid filling phase and the atrial EA wave during the atrial contraction phase. E by A ratio is calculated as E wave velocity divided by A wave velocity. So, this is the E wave in pulse Doppler echocardiography of the mitral wall and this is the A wave E by A ratio can be calculated. The end expiratory occlusion test. During mechanical ventilation, each insufflation increases the intrathoracic pressure and impedes venous return, thus interrupting the respiratory cycle at end expiration, inhibits the 
cyclic impediment in venous return and transiently increases cardiac preload. It has been demonstrated that if a 15 second end expiratory occlusion increases the arterial pressure or the pulse contour derived cardiac index by more than 5%, the response of cardiac output to a 500 ml saline infusion can be predicted with good sensitivity and specificity. So, there are certain commercially available hemodynamic monitoring systems which can tell you about the volume status and fluid responsiveness of the patient. Let's look at some of them. Most importantly, the bioreactance technology device is NICOM, is a non invasive. Non invasive continuous cardiac output measurements can be obtained with the NICOM device. Fewer validation studies are available, accuracy may be decreased in critical illnesses. Then, plethysmographic wave of analysis uh, the device is radical 7, is a non invasive measurement. Continuous cardiac output measurements can be obtained, which gives you variations over time. It's easy to use and non invasive. Decreased accuracy with poor perfusion requires calibration very frequently. Validated in ventilated patients with a greater than tidal volume of greater than 8 ml per kg. So, next is pulmonary artery catheter. Device name is Vigilance. It's a central arterial catheter. Uses the thermodilution principle. Measurements of multiple hemodynamic parameters. Cardiac output measurement gold standard. It's highly invasive. Intermittent cardiac output measurements can be done. Poor predictor for fluid responsiveness. Pulse contour analysis, you have multiple techniques like flow track, lead co, pico. Flow track is the arterial catheter, uses the pulse wave analysis technology. Uh, lead co is an arterial catheter, uses lithium dilution. Central arterial and venous catheters use thermodilution in pico technology. They are all invasive, but they can measure continuous cardiac output measurements with accuracy. PRAM, again one more arterial catheter, uses the pulse wave analysis technique. No calibration is required, continuous cardiac output measurements can be determined. Few studies validated the use, so not yet coming to commercial use. Clear sight, next fin, non-invasive pulse wave analysis, volume view, central and venous catheters, thermodilution techniques. Again, they are non-invasive and continuous cardiac output measurements can be done. Ultrasound, cardio Q with an esophageal probe uses Doppler ultrasound. It is well validated and gives you continuous cardiac output measurements, but it is operator dependent.